Compostable packaging is steaming up the scene with its hot piles of compost. Have you ever seen the certification on compostable packaging and ever wonder what they mean? Well, today I'm gonna fill you in on that. We're gonna be covering heaps of information over a two part series or one part, probably haven't decided yet, but there's gonna be more information that you'd probably like to know, such as why is composting so important? What are the different types of composting and technologies? Welcome to Composting 101. You guys excited? Cause I'm pumped. My name is Elash P. You're tuned into Food Packaging TV. Before we begin, I need to give a huge shout out to Lauren Olson, Zero Waste Manager at World Centric, who has conducted a webinar on the National Learning About Composting Day. Yeah, it's a thing. She shared a wealth of information on today's topic, and so I'll be caught up in a lot of her details from her presentation and sharing them with you today. So as I sat through her presentation, I started to understand why certain industrial composting facilities accept or don't accept compostable packaging products. Ultimately, these composters sell compost, and depending on the type of certification that these composts are obtaining, ultimately their certification is either gonna increase or decrease the value of their product which is why it's also known as black gold. So as we dive deeper into this topic, we're gonna to start, start from scratch, pretending as if you know nothing about what's happening inside our landfills and why composting is so important for our ecosystem. So let's begin. Have a look at this pie chart. It's from the 2017 EPA, Materials and Waste Recycling, which basically points out exactly what's going into our landfills. And when I say ours, I mean the US and they, but Canada has very similar numbers. So notice that the food, yard trimmings, and wood make up to 35% of landfills, which could have been composted. You can even look at the leather and some of the textiles. They could have been composted as well, but currently it's not available with many of our composting systems. This really shows that composting should play a bigger role in our waste management strategy. Especially when looking at Ontario's largest landfills, Ontario's seven largest landfills, and their total remaining capacity, which is only 44%. Not to mention that Ontario ships almost one third of our waste to Michigan. And this is set to decrease as landfill tipping taxes increase 1100% per imperial ton. Yowza! According to the same EPA study, most food scraps are unfortunately landfilled. So you have three fourths of food waste landfilled and just 6% that are composted. And this number is based on industrial composting or commercial composting. That might happen on a municipal level, but it does not take into account or may not take into account of all the people that are composting at home or might get rid of their food scraps some other way. Again, this is from 2017. Hopefully things are changing in the way municipalities are handling this waste. If these food scraps are put into the landfill, they create methane. And methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. We often hear about carbon dioxide and its effect on creating man-made climate change, but methane, is 34 times more potent than carbon dioxide itself because this molecule has the ability to trap heat into our earth ecosystem. So the way landfills work, it can be a little confusing because you may see a landfill and not realize that every night or every other night, depending on the type of setup that they have, it is covered with a layer of sand anywhere from eight to 12 inches. And what that's doing, it's causing the entire heap to become an anaerobic environment. Anaerobic means that methane is produced and methane-loving bacteria live in this environment, as opposed to a compost pile, which is aerobic, and that means oxygen is introduced, and it's a totally different ecosystem with respect to the bacteria, microbes, and fungi that live in the landfill versus the compost. So whenever food waste enters the landfill, this is very bad for climate change. Project Drawdown, which I put in the description, it's the world's largest leading resource on climate change solutions, found that two to three gigatons of greenhouse gases could be reduced by composting as opposed to landfilling. So keep in mind, worldwide, 8% of greenhouse gases are produced from food waste, whether it's pre-consumer waste or those that go unused, like that at the supermarket. They all contribute to the greenhouse gases. And part of our goal at NK and at Food Packaging TV is that our compostable containers are meant to be composted so that the food waste can go with the compostable containers in the composting system, as opposed to entering the landfill. So what can be composted? This can be confusing because 
It's one of those terms that seems to be interchangeable with biodegradable or degradable, and it can be heavily overused and may even be considered greenwashing. What you want to look for are compostable containers that are bio-based, meaning that they're made from a biological carbon, not a fossil fuel carbon. So in terms of degradable, technically everything is degradable. Even this earth will degrade eventually. But in terms of biodegradable, it means that it will degrade due to a microbial activity. So those microorganisms work in tandem to break down the products to smaller pieces, but it may not fully go away or turn into soil. And nor is it healthy for micro ecosystems. So that's where compostable, a term that comes into effect. With compostable, we're really talking about what is good for the microbes, while biodegrading, which eventually becomes into compost or dirt, which is good for plants. Commercial composting will definitely look different from your backyard composting pile. This is a composting site in American Canyon, California called the Napa Recycling and Compost. Now here's how the process works. The refuse collector, they collect the food waste, the yard debris, and the other compostable products and bring them to the composting facility. They then go through a sorting process and the larger items are ground up. Now it's important to have a size reduction in order to have the speed of the composting process go up as larger items take longer to disintegrate and degrade. So you compare, say for example, a wood log versus ground up wood chips. The log would certainly take a lot longer to process versus the wood chips. So therefore, to have a quick turnover while composting smaller is better. The material is piled up in windrows or aerated static pile systems and some other systems which we're going to cover in a few moments, but the material is manually turned and aerated for about two weeks to achieve an actual breakdown. Could be longer, and the longer the time you have, the better product you'll get, as the microbes will also get more time to quote-unquote work. They then go through the final screening, remove any unwanted debris such as small sticks or compostable products that fully didn't break down, or even plastic or glass that might have gotten in the system. And finally, after several weeks and piles, it's ready for landscaping or gardens. Coming back to the various types of systems, these are the two most common systems that you may find at a commercial composting facility. One, this is the aerated turned windrow. Now, this picture is actually of a small system. They can actually become quite large from around 20 feet wide and perhaps about 30 feet high as an example. It's a very commonly used system and they could even use this simple equipment to turn over the piles. It doesn't have to be something like a windrow turner. Now, the aerated static pile, you'll see on the right, and this is the type of system that they have to use more wood chips in the bottom because they're a little bit more porous and they pump in oxygen. And they might even add some water into the system. Now at Napa and Recycling and Compost, they actually have quite an advanced system where they have a concrete pad that has sensors that automatically adds water and oxygen as needed. Some of the advantages of an aerated pile and composters are that they don't disturb, or their systems rather, they don't disturb the fungi populations from growing. Therefore, you get better breakdown. A windrow is great. You know, you can turn over piles as often as you want because the machinery is actually readily available. And you'll often see composters that are utilizing both systems based on whatever type of materials that they're collecting. There are some composting covers that are utilized in the composting industry. They have the Gore, which is made out of Gore-Tex. This is a waterproof yet breathable fabric membrane. And this is basically used to heat up the pile or to prevent too much moisture from evaporating. Now, the same goes for the roof cover. It can be used to prevent erosion or smells. And really, the cover really depends on the type of permits the composting facility has. And what ecosystems they're actually working with. In-vessel composting. Now this is becoming more popular in terms of campuses or closed environments that are buying this type of system. They are more expensive to run compared to a windrow or an aerated pile as you have to get this container and inside there might be an auger or something which mixes the composting for you. So you don't have to do the manual work. Now, if you let this compost rest in the in-vessel container and as you collect more green waste, you have to start putting them into a secondary in-vessel container, which is oftentimes used two at a time in tandem. These are great technologies to help deal with waste, and I believe they make a great case for large churches or temples, agro-growers, large food processors, college, university campuses, and even prisons, where in-vessel systems may reduce their overall waste costs because they don't have to pay to have their waste or their food waste 
picked up and it offers the ability to teach kids of the science of nature at your Sunday school as well it gives job experience with respect to composting. And on the other side you've got anaerobic digestion. Not to be confused with aerobic, anaerobic. These systems are methane generating systems and they're sometimes described as a landfill on steroids. So these digesters use methane producing bacteria to break down the biomass quickly as possible. And with that, with that methane from the anaerobic digestion, they can use it to burn or create CO2 and utilize that energy. So if you're interested in this type of tech, check out Green Mountain Technologies where you can buy the in-vessel systems or just Google it, in-vessel composting and see many companies that are now making them or just starting up. Once the compost is ready, the commercial composters take their product and apply for several different certifications. One of the most popular certifications is the Organic Material Review Institute, or OMRI for short. Now, this follows the USDA National Organic Program. If you get an OMRI certification for your compost, you can get about, about double the price for your compost, which is huge, especially when a lot of these composters are running on really thin budgets. So unfortunately, the way the National Organic Program's rules were set back in the 70s, it does not allow for PLA, which is polylactic acid, or any other bioplastics to be permissible within the OMRI certif certified compost. There can be a small percentage of PLA, and that's allowed to be in the compost anywhere between 1 and 5%, but in effect, this becomes a huge deterrent for composters to accept PLA compostable products because they want to get that OMRI certification. Well, hopefully the rules change because this inhibits implementing a full circular economy with the compostable products. The other composting certification that is most common by composters in the US and they is the Compost Council's STA, which is the Seal of Testing Assurance Composting. And this really verifies that the compost has nitrogen, phosphorus, and all the different chemical components and biological conditions that allow compost to help plants thrive. Bioplastics were actually allowed under this certification so this certification is an option for composters and of course some composters want only to opt for the US Com Compost Council's STA because it's a little bit cheaper and you can get way more products certified. Mind you, composters can also have a dual stream which may have compostable containers etc in one stream and perhaps their pre-consumer food and yard waste trimmings in another which can be then certified as organic. In terms of composting facilities, WorldCentric has researched and reviewed hundreds of different waste sites and they've come up with the following. I'm going to have one for Canada and I'll have to make a separate video when it's ready, but green waste. Most sites in America are green waste, which include yard debris, grass, leaves, branches, and part of the reason why most composting facilities are only green waste is because that's how composting was first viewed in America. Commercial composting was really an answer for all the leaves that accumulated in the autumn season or the sticks and debris that was found in the yard. It was an answer to that problem. This system wasn't an answer for an example if a restaurant had extra food that could be donated to a food bank and have their collection from this type of compost. This is actually uh, was never the idea. Unless they get more funding, they may be stuck in that cycle. Food scraps. This system focuses on pre-consumer product. For example, a food processing facility where a product may be rejected because it doesn't meet certain aesthetic looks, gets tossed out, or may have scrap left over after processing the food. Food waste. This is considered post-consumer food waste, so that might be things such as oil and grease and leftover foods. This requires a different type of composting system because you need to ensure that the compost gets hot and breaks down these pathogens balancing the carbon and nitrogen in order to make some composting aerobic so it doesn't go anaerobic on you. This process is naturally more labor intensive and requires more patience than you may be otherwise set up for. Fiber compostables and all compostable products. For compostable food packaging, this is the holy grail. And this is what you need to look for when partnering with a commercial composting facility for your restaurant or supermarket waste management. They add up to a smaller number of the composting facilities, but they do accept either all bioplastics or just fiber. Composting facilities that accept fiber may still be able to achieve organic certification because most fiber containers do not have any sorts of bioplastics in them. So this allows them to get their organic certified compost out of their entire system. This is where we really start getting into the packaging side. What the heck do you look for? What do they mean? And which is right for you? One of the most widely used certifications on compostable products in North America is BPI. 
which stands for Biodegradable Products Institute. This is a nonprofit organization that reviews and certifies compostable products that meet the ASTM 6400 and 6868, which is a test. ASTM stands for American Society of Testing and Materials. They're a committee of scientists which come up with the test methods, and these test methods are carefully vetted so that they're essentially the gold standard of how to make sure your products are going to be tested to ensure they're indeed compostable. This certification holds all compostable products meeting the same thresholds, which ensures consistency among the industry. When you see a product with the BPI certification, it's telling you that the product that you're going to be utilizing is indeed meeting the ASTM tests and BPI is mainly used in North America. So that's what majority of the time you'll be seeing. In Europe, they have a similar system and it's called TUF Austria. It loosely translates to the Technical Association certification. Uh, and this has been authorized by the European Bioplastics Council to certify products are meeting the compostability standards. They have their own standards, which is the EN 13432, which is almost equivalent to the ASTM 6400, some minor differences, but primarily TUF is used in Europe, although you may find these certifications in North America. They have several different compostability certifications, including a home composting certification and an industrial composting certification. On their website, they have other certifications that they're coming out with, including marine degradability. Check out the description below for the links. The Compost Manufacturers Alliance, or CMA, is the third certification we're going to discuss today. And this was developed out of the Cedar Grove composting sites in the Pacific Northwest. And they really saw a need to field test the products in a commercial composting facility before they went out to the marketplace. Really what they're trying to do is they're looking for the gap between a lab study and real world conditions. There are variables that change such as weather or temperature, which is not in a factor within a lab environment. So it's interesting to see if the products indeed break down at a composting facility. So what they do is they test products in a mesh bag that you'll see in the picture. And it looks like it might be an aerated static pile. They put the product in the bag with some compost and they cover it up. And after a certain period, the team would go back to check on the bags to see how the test products degraded or biodegraded compared to the control test. Look out for products that are also marked with the CMA certification. Compostability certifications have four major parts, which are biodegradation, disintegration, ecotoxicity, and chemicals of concern. So let's get right into them. Biodegradation is the breakdown of the biomass products using microbes, fungi, and other microorganisms to create carbon dioxide from the actual carbon of the material. Check out the biodegradation comparison between the different types of certifications we noted. They're pretty much all the same, which is that they have to biodegrade 90% of the organic car uh, carbon into carbon dioxide in less than 180 days. The OK Compost Home gives it a lower temperature and therefore a longer time duration, which is pretty much double up to 360 days, almost entire year, at a home compost because you're not going to have the huge amounts of biomass as you would compare to a commercial composting facility. So you're not going to be able to generate that kind of heat in the pile. If you ever go to a commercial composting facility, those composting piles are a hot. I mean, they're actually steaming. If you're lucky to get that at home, then you, my friend, are a CEO of composting and you must come to my house and pay me a visit. Disintegration is really about the breakdown of the product into smaller pieces. Ideally, the remnants or residuals must be visually indistinguishable from the other organic materials. So in other words, it should look like dirt. For most of these certifications, BPI, TUF, OK Industrial, and CMA, this image, about 90% disintegration in less than 84 days with remnants less than two millimeters. So they've put this through a filter, made sure 90% is disintegrated within 84 days. So again, at home composting, you're given twice the amount of time with the realization that your pile may not work as quickly as a commercial composting facility would. So this is an image of a test that was performed in a world-centric fiber tray. And as you can see, they've had some great success. Now, just because something is biodegradable or disintegrates doesn't mean that it's great for compost. And that's where ecotoxicity comes into play. The products must achieve biodegradation and disintegration tests, but it also has to allow plants to germinate and flourish because after all, that's the point of compost, to allow plants to grow and thrive without the use of chemical fertilizers. And of course, these tests are there to weed out any residual of heavy metals or other chemicals of concern. And so BPI and TUF Austria OK Compost Industrial use the same organization of economic cooperation and development 
208 standards for the ecotoxicity, which tests plants itself for their growth with the respective final compost products. As mentioned, there is a test for heavy metals. The US and European limits do vary slightly and any amount of heavy metals that exist in compostable packaging that are there occur naturally. They're not added during the manufacturing process. Now, these numbers are reflective of only world-centric TPLA, PLA, and fiber trays. And by the way, they're way below the limits and they continuously monitor these results. In terms of chemicals of concern, hazardous chemicals are supposed to be self-reported. And as part of the ASTM testing, it cannot have any substances that are persistent or bioaccumulative chemicals under the US EPA or EU REACH Annex. And for EN 13432, which is to reiterate that they're almost the equivalent of the US ASTM standards, they're looking at the EU REACH Annex. In terms of PFAS, which we've discussed many times before, BPI says it cannot have more than 100 parts per million of total fluorine covering the thousands of fluorinated substances that exist. There are anywhere between six to 10,000 different fluorinated compounds that exist. So this test is for all of them, honing on the elemental fluorine, not to be confused with fluoride, fluorine. Not only do these factories and distributors now have to declare that a, pro a product contains PFAS, but they also make a declaration, or you'll have to make a declaration that states that if you have PFAS free lines that they're being kept and or produced separately, and ensure that there will not be any cross-contamination of fluorine with the PFAS-free lines. TÜV Austria OK Compost Industrial says they cannot have any more than 62 fluorinated substances, and that's quite specific on their EU REACH Annex list, which fluorine is not necessarily regulated. They don't have any sort of testing for PFAS as does BPI. So bear in mind that in 2020, if you see a BPI symbol, it basically means it's testing for PFAS and any other harmful chemicals. So if you used to buy products that used to have the BPS certification in the box and it no longer bears a badge, it could mean that they're entering either a validating status format or perhaps the product does contain PFAS and it didn't pass the BPI test. The CMA will also be starting a very similar rule to that of BPI by January 1st, 2021, which again, the product cannot have or contain more than 100 parts per million of fluorine. So a quick comparison between these certifications, both BPI, TUF, OK Industrial are very similar, but they do have different limits on heavy metals where TUF, OK Industrial is a little bit more stringent. On PFAS, BPI is more strict, but they have similar tests to ensure compostability of the product. CMA requires the same tests that are either used for BPI or TUF, OK Industrial compost when they conduct their tests as they're gonna be examining the biodegradation process at a commercial composting facility. And the OK Home Compost, and this is really about understanding that the timeline is lower because the temperature is lower for to account for real world conditions, and that's most likely gonna occur in your backyard composting system. This is all great news for all of world-centric products because they meet the ASTM 6400, 6868. To give you a rundown of all the certifications that world-centric holds, have a look at the categories of compostable product offering. So in terms of molded fiber, PLA, CPLA, TPLA, etc. Many CMA approved, some that are even TOOF, OK Compost, home, which is for their bio waste food scrap waste bags that can go into your backyard home compost system. You can check out World Centric's website to review their lab reports for more details, which I've included in the description below. So what can you do? Well, you can create a compost bin at home to utilize your community's program to keep food waste out of the landfill. Anything you can do to keep food waste out of the landfill, you're contributing to the reduction of greenhouse gases and overall climate change, which is super important. Advocate for a commercial composting in your community by contacting your local representatives and press that you need them to accept compostable products as well as food and yard scraps. I know that we might be entering a period of economic downturn and people are looking to perhaps cut programs. But if you cannot accept compostable products and food scraps, you're really selling your community short in the long term because these products are gonna be put into the landfill and ultimately these landfills will reach capacity and then that'll just lead to more landfills, which is a very expensive process. So we might as, may as well get it out of our waste system and into a commercial composting system. But it often takes many community members pressing for the need of acceptance of compostable products in their commercial composting system. Talk to your landlord or your condo or apartment governing body to see if you can get either a backyard composting or 
a residential pickup of composting. And also connect with your local farms and community gardens that might be able to use your food scraps. And finally, that's gonna do it for today's episode of Food Packaging TV. Was it exciting for you? Cause we're done, finito. Thank you for sticking it through my friend. My name is Yilesh P. It's time for me to yabba dabba do, but before I do, make sure you subscribe, like, share, ding that little bell. You know what to do.